section twenty five of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the white wolf and other fireside tales by sir arthur thomas quiller couch two boys i dare say they never saw and perhaps never will see one another i met them on separate railway journeys and the dates are divided by five years almost one boy was travelling third class the other first the age of each when i made his very slight acquaintance with the one i did not even exchange a word was about fourteen almost certainly their lives and their stories have no connection outside of my thoughts but i think of them often and together they have grown up the younger will be a man by this time if i met them now their altered faces would probably be quite strange to me and yet the two boys remain my friends and that is why i take leave to include them among these stories of my friends part one the first boy i never heard his name was seated in the third-class smoking carriage when i joined my train at plymouth seated beside his mother an overheated countrywoman in a state of subsiding fussiness we had a good five minutes to wait but as such women always will she had made a bolt for the first door within reach of course she found herself in a smoking compartment and of course she disliked tobacco but could not although she made two false starts make up her mind to change she had dropped upon one of the middle seats and dragged her boy down into the next thus leaving me the only vacant corner the others were occupied by a couple of drovers and a middle-aged man with a newspaper which he read column by column advertisements and all without raising his eyes for a moment the guard just outside the carriage door had his whistle to his lips and his green flag lifted ready to wave when the woman asked can anyone tell me if this train goes to london the drovers and i assured her that it did it stops at bristol doesn't it my ticket is for bristol the train was in motion by this time we set her mind at ease she opened a limp basket called a frail i believe produced an apple and offered it to the boy he shook his head he was a passably good-looking coltish boy in a best suit which he had outgrown and a hard black hat the brim of which annoyed him when he leaned back a binding of black braid advertised what it was meant to conceal that the cuffs of his jacket had been lengthened and yet as he sat with his hands crossed in his lap he displayed a good deal of wrist his eyes took my liking at once eyes of a good grey black or shall i say of a grey with fine glooms in it they looked at you straight but without staring neither furtively nor with embarrassment nor curiously nor again sleepily but with that rare blend of candour and reserve which allowed you to see that he was thinking his own thoughts and had no reason to be ashamed of them having taken stock of us he gazed thoughtfully out of the window his mother sighed from time to time and searched her basket to make sure that this that or the other trifle had not been left behind the drovers conversed apart the middle-aged man who sat facing the engine read away pertinaciously at his newspaper which he kept folded small by reason of the strong southerly breeze playing in through the open window and i divided my attention between the landscape and the map at the beginning of stevenson's kidnapped then barely a week old a delight to be approached with trepidation so we were sitting when the train crawled over the metals beyond tynemouth station gathered speed and swung into full view of the open sea as the first strong breath of it came rushing in at the window i heard a shuffle of feet the boy had risen and with his eyes was asking our leave to stand by the door i drew in my knees to make way for him and so after a moment did the middle-aged man 
he did not thank us but stepped past politely enough and stood with his hand on the leathern window strap i stared out of a little side window wondering what had caught his attention and while i wondered suddenly the child broke into song it was the queerest artless performance it had no tune in it no intelligible words it was just a chant rising and falling as the surf at the base of the sea wall boomed and tossed its spray on the wind fanning his face and while he chanted his serious eyes devoured the blue leagues right away to the horizon the drovers at the far end of the compartment turned their faces inward and grinned the middle-aged man looked across at me behind the boy's back with a half smile and resumed his reading the mother laughed apologetically tis his way he won't be so crazed for it in a few weeks time i reckon he's going up to bristol to be bound apprentice to his uncle his uncle's master of a sailing ship but the boy did not hear there are four or five tunnels in the red sandstone between tonmouth and dawlish and through these he sang on in a low repressed voice which broke out high and clear and strong as we swept again into the large wind and sunshine at dawlish station we drew up for a minute and the porter on the up platform nodded to one of the drovers and asked what's the matter with ye in there nothing nothing we got a smoking concert on said the drover across the rails a group waiting for the down train stood and stared at the boy whispered and smiled and i can still recall the fascinated gaze of a plump urchin of six as he gripped with one hand a wooden spade and with the other his mother's skirt but the boy sang on heedless and still sang on as we left dawlish behind there was no jubilation in his chant but through it all there ran and rang out from time to time a note of high challenge perhaps i read too much in it for in the heart of a boy many thoughts sing together before they come to birth and to the destinies we see so distinctly he marches through a haze drawn onward by incommunicable yearnings but as unseen by him i glanced up at his blown hair and eager parted lips the chant seemed to grow articulate o oh, see i am coming o oh, fate waiting and waited for i salute you friend or adversary we meet to try each other for your wonders i have eyes for your trials a heart use me for i am ready as we turned inland and ran beside the shore of the x his song died down and ceased for a while he stood conning the river the boats the red cliffs and whitewashed towns on the farther bank and so as we came in sight of the cathedral towers stepped back and dropped into his seat well now said his mother you be a funny boy for a moment he did not seem to hear then started and came out of his daydream with a furious blush i looked away part two the second boy wore a well-cut eton suit and sat in the smoking compartment of a padded corridor carriage with a silk-lined overcoat beside him and a silver-mounted suitcase in the rack above he was not smoking nor was he reading but he sat on a great pile of papers and magazines and stared straight in front of him that is to say straight at me his stare though constant and unrelenting was not in the least offensive it had no curiosity in it he had obviously been contemplating the cushions before i intruded and since i had chosen to occupy his field of vision he contemplated me i had no speaking acquaintance with the boy but he bore the features of his family and his initials were on the suitcase above so i knew him for the only son of a man who had once shown me civility the youngest and least extravagantly wealthy of three rich brothers since one of these brothers had never married and now was not likely to it lay beyond guessing what wealth the boy would inherit some day he was by no means ill-looking 
and quite certainly no fool his face carried the stamp of his father's ability it puzzled me what he could be doing with that pile of papers and magazines or why having burdened himself with them he should choose to sit and stare instead of reading them for his station lay but a twenty minutes run below mine and it was impossible that in the time he could have glanced through the half of them he had been staring at me or through me maybe for half an hour when our train slowed down and came to a standstill above the steep valley between bodmin road and double boy after a couple of minutes wait the boy rose and went to the window in the corridor to see what was happening and i took this opportunity to glance across at the papers scattered on the vacant seat they included three or four sixpenny and threepenny magazines a large illustrated paper black and white i think half a dozen penny weeklies titbits answers pearson's weekly castle's saturday journal i forget what others halfpenny papers in a heap all kinds of cuts snippets siftings echoes snapshots and sidelights pars about people christian sweepings our happy fireside and the masher many lay face downward coyly hiding their titles but disclosing such headlines as facts about the flag books which have influenced the bishop of london he gave him fits our unique competition mr cecil rhodes a powerful personality and what becomes of old stage scenery in the midst of my survey the train began to move forward again and the boy came back to his seat it's only some plate layers on the viaduct he explained they held up their flag against us i suppose they were just finishing a job nasty place to leave the rails said i glancing over the parapet upon the green treetops fifty feet below us i was thinking that said he and a queer tremor in his young voice made me glance at him sharply and then suddenly i understood or thought i did you at any rate are pretty well insured said i twenty thousand pounds and a little over the coupons cost four and two pence altogether and then at the end of the journey you can use up all the reading wonderful i kept a serious face and i suppose all this time you've been staring at me amazed by the recklessness of your elders he flushed slightly have i been staring i beg your pardon i'm sure it's a trick i have i begin thinking of things and then thinking i suppose of how it would feel to be in a collision or what it would be like to leap such a parapet as that and find ourselves dropping dropping into space but you shouldn't really it isn't healthy in a boy like you and if you'll listen to one who has known what nerves are it may too easily grow to mean something worse but it isn't that exactly he protested though of course all that comes into it i'm not a a funk sir i was thinking more of the of what would come afterwards you know oh dear i groaned to myself it's worse than ever here's a little prig worrying about his soul i shouldn't advise you to trouble about that either i said aloud but i don't trouble about it he hesitated and stumbled into a burst of confidence you see i'm no good at games athletics and and that sort of thing again he stopped and i nodded to encourage him and i'm no swell at schoolwork either i went to school late and after home it all seemed so young if you understand i thought i did with his polite grown-up manner i could understand his isolation among the urchins the masters and all the interests of an ordinary school but my father you know him don't you he's disappointed about it he'd like me to bring home prizes or cups i don't think he'd mind what it was so long as he could be proud about it of course he never says anything but a fellow gets to know i dare say you're right i said but what has this to do with insuring yourself for twenty thousand pounds 
well you see i'm to go into the bank some day and i expect my father thinks i shall be just as big a duffer at that i know he does but i'm not if he'd only trust me a bit so now if we were to smash up collide go off the rails run over a bridge or something of that sort just think how he'd feel when he found out i'd cleared twenty thousand by it so that's what you were picturing to yourself he nodded that and the smash and all i kept saying now if it comes this moment and i wondered a little how it would take you suddenly whether you'd start up or fall forward and if you would say anything you're a cheerful companion he grinned politely and afterwards just before the train stopped i had a splendid idea i began making my will you see i know something about investments i read about them every day in the boy's own paper we take in the standard in our school library and i have it all to myself unless there's a war on i've heard my father say often that it's a very reliable paper and so it is for i've tried it for two years now so if i left a will telling just how the twenty thousand ought to be invested it would open my father's eyes more than ever my dear sir said i don't be in a hurry serve out your time among the barbarians at school and i'll promise you in time your father's respectful astonishment these were my two boys and you may wonder why i always think of them together i do though and what is more i find that together they help to explain to me my country's greatness End of section 25section twenty six of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gillian hendry the white wolf and other fireside tales by sir arthur thomas quiller couch section twenty six the senior fellow there is at Oxford a small college with a small bursar's garden that in spring is ablaze with laburnum and scented with lilac. And in the old wall of this garden, just beneath the largest laburnum tree, you may still find a stone with this inscription, Jesus have mercy on Miles Tonkin, fellow, anno 1545. This college, in the days when I knew it, had three marks of distinction. It turned out, on hunting mornings, more pinks for its size than any other in Oxford. Its boat was head of the river, and its senior fellow was the Reverend Theobald Pumphrey, who knew more of Athenaeus than any man in the world. He seldom lectured, but day by day, year after year, sat in the window above this same small garden, and accumulated notes for the great edition of his pet author, that some day, nobody quite knew when, was to make him famous. He was the son of a Cumberland farmer, had come up to the university from a local grammar school, and since then, it was said, had revisited his native village twice only, to bury his father and mother. His mother's death, and that had happened five and twenty years before, left him without a single relative on earth, nor could he be said to have a friend, even among the dons. He rose early, took a solitary walk in the parks, and would spend the rest of the day at his desk by the window. People marvelled sometimes why he had taken holy orders. It was hinted that his scout knew, perhaps, but if so, his scout never divulged the reasons. The scholar was a man, nevertheless, had a humorously wrinkled mouth and an eye that twinkled responsive to a jest, and was the best judge of wine in Oxford. On the strength of this undeniable gift, the dons had long since elected him steward of common room, and he valued the responsibility, abstaining from tobacco, which he loved, to keep pure his taste for vintages, and preserve a discriminating palate among sweets. An utterance of his would hint that even his avoidance of physical exercise was a matter of duty. A man, he said, may work his body, may work his head, and may enjoy his dinner, 
any two of these things he may do, but not all three. For me, I wish to work my head, and must enjoy my dinner. And once, when I dined with him, it was made clear to me that his life was ordered after a plan. It was a summer evening, and he held a glass of claret against the sunset. "'Wife and children!' he cried suddenly. "'Wife and children!' Then, with a wave of his left hand from the claret to the still lawn below us and the lilacs, "'These are my wife and children!' It was whispered at length that his commentary on the first book of the Dipnosophists was all but ready. All through the golden summer and a quiet long vacation it had been maturing, and on the first night of the October term he arranged his piles of notes about him, set a choir of clean manuscript paper on his table, dipped pen in ink pot, and began to muse on the first sentence. An hour passed, and the page was not soiled. Across the still garden came the sound of cab wheels rattling over the distant streets. The undergraduates were coming up for a fresh term. He had heard the sound a hundred times almost, and it did not concern him. He had no lectures to prepare. Another hour passed, and another. The noise of the cabs had died out, and over him was creeping a sick fear, a certainty that he could not write a word. The subject was too immense. He had given his life to Athenaeus, and now Athenaeus was a monster that one man's life and knowledge would not suffice for. Having withheld his pen till he might write adequately, he awoke to find that writing was impossible. A horror took him as he pushed back his chair among the litter of notebooks, and stepping to the window, threw the sash open. Many stars were shining, and between them and the sleeping garden echoed the clamour of a distant supper party. He heard no words, only the noise, but it filled his brain with a sense of the many thousand supper parties that the garden had listened to, of the generations that had come and gone since his own first term, of the boys who had grown into men while he was working at Athenaeus, always Athenaeus. His forehead was burning, and as he pushed his hand across it, he seemed to read in the darkness under the laburnum tree, Jesus have mercy on Miles Tonkin, fellow, anno 1545, and found a new meaning, an irony in the words. Then, because more and more the task of his life became a hopeless weight, he gave a look at his notebooks and escaped out of the room, downstairs into the fresh air of the quad, and across it towards the porter's lodge. He found the porter napping, and, having a private key, he let himself through the big gate and out into the street. No soul was abroad, only the gas lamps threw queer shadows of him on the pavement, and the night breeze struck coldly into him as he hurried along, hating whatever he saw. Soon, under a window in St. Giles, he pulled up. There was a party of young men inside, perhaps the same supper party whose voices he had heard just now. The light from the room flared across the street, but by keeping close under the sill he stood in darkness, and he paused, listening eagerly. Above they were singing a chorus, noted in those days. It was pale dawn, and the sun was touching St. Mary's spire into flame when the heavy-eyed porter heard a key turn in the wicket. It was the senior fellow, and in about half an hour he appeared again at the lodge, carrying a small bag and handed the porter a letter addressed to the president of the college. He then stepped out into the street, and hurried off towards the railway station. For a fortnight we heard nothing of him. Then suddenly he appeared again, on an evening when the college, having won the fours, was commemorating its success by a bonfire in the big quad. A certain freshman, stealing down his staircase with a can of colza oil to feed the flames, was confronted by our missing senior fellow. No, said the great scholar, don't be afraid, and don't seek to hide that oil can, but come in here, and he led the way to his room. This much is mere rumour, for the freshman was always reticent on the encounter and what followed, but many who were present that night can bear witness that a big portmanteau appeared suddenly on the summit of the bonfire, and blazed merrily to ashes, having clearly been saturated with oil, not until long after were its contents divined. The senior fellow went back to his window above the bursar's garden, though henceforward he dined but rarely in common room, and year by year scholars expected his edition of Athenaeus, until he died and left his desk full of notebooks to the youth who had carried the oil can, 
and who in course of years had become junior don also his will expressed a wish that this his favourite pupil might be elected to succeed him as steward of common room the new steward eager to fulfil his duties made it his first business to inspect the college cellars he found there abundance of old port much fair claret a bin of inestimable madeira several casks of more curious wines and among them one labelled for the poor it struck him as a pleasant trait in his dead friend thus to have dispensed in charity that wine which doubtless had gone beyond its age and become unfit for the fellow's palates he drew a glassful and tasted it the first sip was a revelation he returned to his rooms wrote a score of letters inviting to dinner all the acknowledged connoisseurs of other colleges when they had dined with him and fallen into easy attitudes around the table he introduced this wine casually among half a dozen others and watched the result not a man who tasted it would taste any other as for the notebooks those priceless materials for the final edition of athenaeus they were empty mere blank pages only in that labelled number one was there a scrap of the old scholar's handwriting and it began dulce cum sodalibus sapit vinum bonum osculari virginis dulcius est donum donum est dulcissimum musica tironum qui tarara bundiat permit regis thronum end of section twenty six Section 27 of The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Ballast under the green shore that faces the port and at a point that as the meeting place of river and harbour may be called indifferently by either name lay a slim wasted bark at anchor with a sand barge alongside the time was a soft and sunny morning in early january a day that was nature's breathing space after a week of sleet and boisterous winds the gulls were back again from their inland shelters across the upland above the cliff a ploughman drove leisurely forth and back and always close behind his heels the earth was white with these birds inspecting the fresh turned furrow the furze bushes below him were braided with cobwebs and the stays lifts and braces of the bark might have passed also for threads of gossamer spun from her masts and yards so delicately were the lines indicated along the hillside in the sand barge three men were chanting as they worked and their song travelling across still sky and water rose audibly above the stir of traffic even in the narrow streets of the town the bark was taking in ballast and the three men sang as they shovelled for three reasons it helped them to keep time it kept each from shirking his share of the work and lastly perhaps the song cheered them they knew it as the long hundred and it ran there goes one one there is gone oh the rare one and many more to come for to make up the sum of the hundred so long there goes two and so on up to twenty with each line a shovelful of ballast was pitched on board by every man so that when the twenty-six line stanzas were ended each man had thrown one hundred and twenty a long hundred shovelfuls of sand thereupon they paused touched pipe for a minute or two and brushing the back of the hand across their foreheads to wring off the sweat started afresh along the bark's side ran a narrow line of blue paint signifying that the vessel was in mourning that somebody belonging to captain or owner 
was lately dead but in this case it was the captain and owner himself and his chief mourner was a bright-eyed woman with a complexion of cream and roses who now leant over the bulwarks and looked down contemplatively upon the three laborers she was a canadian and her husband too had been a canadian rich more than twice her age and luxurious since his marriage she had accompanied him on all his voyages three months ago his vessel had brought him sick and suffering from congestion of the lungs into this harbor where his cargo of timber was to be unloaded and in this harbor a week later he had died without a doubt of his wife's affection from the deck where she stood she can see between the elms on the hill above the port the white wall of the cemetery where he lay the vessel was hers and a snug little fortune in quebec and she was going back to enjoy it for the homeward voyage she had deputed the captain's responsibilities to the first mate and had raised his pay slightly but the captain's dignity she reserved for herself she wore a black gown of course but not a widow's cap and though in fact a widow of twenty-five had very much more the appearance of a maid of nineteen as she looked down over the bark's side her lips were parted as if to smile at the first provocation on either side of her temples a short brown curl had rebelled and was kissing her cheek the sparkle in her eyes told of capacity to enjoy life behind her a coil of smoke rose from the deck-house chimney she had left the midday meal she was cooking and ought to be back looking after it instead she lingered and looked upon the three men at work below two of them were old round-shouldered with labor their necks burnt brown with stooping in the sun the third was a young giant tall fair and straight with yellowish hair that curled up tightly at the back of his head and lumbar muscles that swelled and sank in a pretty rhythm as he pitched his ballast and sang there goes nine nine there is gone it was upon this man that the woman gazed as she lingered his shirt-collar was cut low at the back and his freckled neck was shining with sweat she wanted him to look up and yet she was afraid of his looking up she wondered if he were married at his age she phrased it to herself and if so what manner of wife he had she told herself after a while that she really dreaded extremely being caught observing these three laborers that she hated even in seeming to lose dignity and still she bent and heard the song to the twentieth and last verse the young giant when the spell was over leant on his shovel for a moment and then reached out a hand for the cider keg one of his comrades passed it to him he wiped the orifice tilted his head back and drank as a man drinks at midday after a long morning some of the cider trickled down his crisp yellow beard and he shook his head scattering the drops off then the keg was tilted again and suddenly lowered as he was on the point of drinking his eyes had encountered those of the woman on the deck as they did so the woman recovered all her boldness without in the least knowing what prompted her she bent a little further forward and asked what is your name young man william muddy ma'am do you mind breaking off work for a moment and stepping up here certainly ma'am william muddy laid down his shovel at once a shiver of fear went through the young widow why had she asked him up why on a mere impulse because she wanted to see him closer nothing more what possible excuse could she give she heard the sound of his heavy boots on the ship's ladder he would be before her in a moment expecting of course to be set to work on some odd job or other she cast about wildly and could think of no job that wanted doing it was appalling she could not possibly explain as has happened before now to women her very weakness saved her in extremity 
William Utty, clambering heavily over the ship's side, found her leaning against the deckhouse with a face as white as the painted boards against which her palm rested. "'What be I to do, ma'am?' he inquired after a pause, and then added slowly, "'Begging your pardon, but be you taken unwell?' "'Yes,' she panted, speaking very faintly. "'I was over there, by the bulwarks, and suddenly I felt queer, a faintness. I looked over and saw you. I called the first person I saw. I wanted help.' William Uddy was puzzled. He had not noticed any pallor in the face that had looked down on him from the ship's side. On the contrary, he seemed to remember that it struck him as remarkably fresh and rosy. But he saw no reason for doubting he had been mistaken. "'Can I do aught for e? Fetch a doctor?' if you wouldn't mind helping me down down to my cabin william took her arm gently and led her aft to the companion ladder at the top of it she put out a hand vaguely and closed her eyes i don't think she murmured that i can walk my head is going round so could you would it be too heavy if you carried me at any other time william would have considered this a good joke as it was he took her up like a feather in his arms and carried her down to the cabin there he set her down on the sofa and was about to withdraw blushing he was a very shy youth and had never carried a woman before let alone one who was his superior in station thank you she said in a voice that was little above a whisper how easily you carried me it's plain to see you're a married man William started. There you're wrong, ma'am. Pardon me for saying it. No? You were so gentle. So gentle, although so big. She smiled faintly. Would you mind stepping to the cupboard there and pouring me out a wine glass full of sherry? It's in the decanter just inside. William poured out a glass full and set it on the table in front of her. She put it to her lips and having scarcely moistened them, set it down again. "'A glass for yourself,' she said. "'Come now. Do. I see you are shocked at the number of bottles I keep here, but they were my husband's. He died, you know, a week after we came into harbour.' William's face worked to express mute sympathy. "'It's a fearful responsibility,' she went on, being left alone like this with a vessel to look after, and all his property waiting over there on the other side of the water, and I dare say the lawyers there waiting, too, to take advantage of me. I think it's having all this on my mind that makes my head so giddy at times. William stood opposite to her and thought. It is not known at what moment the brilliant idea struck him that as a husband he might be a tower of strength to the fragile young creature on the sofa his comrades after waiting some time for him began their chant again there goes one one there is gone and while they sang it william began that courtship which ended three weeks later in his sailing for canada he went as a bridegroom or perhaps if we must reckon him as part of the ship's equipment as ballast End of section 27 and end of the white wolf and other fireside tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch